Well, welcome everyone again. Thanks for joining us. February 22nd regular meeting uh, of the Hadley Public School Committee. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We have um, one adjustment to the agenda so far. The action item underneath um, number nine, uh, action item E, approval disposition of property. We're going to table that for another time. I believe that is in relation to a school bus. Uh, any other adjustments to the agenda? Not that I have. All right. Great. Well, um, we're really excited to start this meeting with um, a Q&A forum. So what we'd like to do is have um, a presentation on the pooled testing plan and then provide an opportunity for Q&A within uh, the structure of our school committee meeting, which is great uh, that we can do this before we enter into uh, public comment, which we will still hold. Uh, and then we will get into our the remainder of our agen agenda presentation and discussion items. The Q&A for the pooled testing, um, after we discuss the plan, uh, we'd like to make sure that that ends no later than 6 p.m. so that we can continue on with the remainder of our items and public comment. So with that, uh, Annie, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I am going to be sharing my screen. I'm also right now going to introduce Robin Sizz, who is a parent and also a school nurse. And at when we get to the portion of the presentation where we talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of how it works, Robin will be chiming in right before we open it up to questions, if anyone has any questions. If you don't have questions this evening, please know that you can email me and I'll make sure that either if I can't answer the question, uh, I'll make sure that the right people get your questions so that they can answer it and we will get started. I'll share this presentation. Hmm. I hope I will. There we go. Okay, and I hope this works. Ah, we we can see your screen. You can, but yes. it won't let me um, shoot. It won't let me fast forward on the slides. Let me do something else here. Give me one second. Uh, And now my computer's stuck. Life is great for me. Oh, there we go. All right. Is it still sharing? No. Nope. No. Nope. Right. Let's do that. Let's do this. It's not going to be attractive, but that's all right. You folks are uh, kind, so. I believe for those who uh, would prefer there's a link in our agenda right yeah and so you're just going to see the ugly version that's all right though so our pool testing i'm going to skip right ahead to why so why do we want to do this it is just one more strategy in all of our mitigation efforts so we have and tonight we'll talk a little bit about the foresight that's been demonstrated by our reopening team the folks who really deserve the credit, which are our building leaders, our union, and our school nurses, as well as the school committee. Our mitigation efforts reflected back in August the guidance that the CDC just recently published. But two things that we couldn't do, or I should say one wasn't available and one uh, it was a question of funding at that time. So back in August, vaccines were not an option, which are now listed as one more mitigation strategy in the updated CDC guidance for reducing risk when schools are open for in-person instruction and testing. And testing is something that the school committee discussed back in August, but the tests that we were looking at at the time, individual PCR tests were pretty cost prohibitive. They run about $47 per test, and it would require every single person to do a test once a week. We, um, as you know, use physical distancing, mask wearing, frequent cleaning and disinfecting, um, and we have provided families with a symptom checklist, and we ask families to check their children for symptoms before sending them to school. So testing, just to reiterate, it's just one piece of the puzzle, and I'm, I am pleased to announce that these other pieces are consistently implemented in Hadley Public Schools, requiring masks to be worn at all times, even though the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education said that we could limit that to children in grades two and up, 
We've made it a requirement for all students who are present for in-person learning, as well as all of our staff, uh, maintaining physical distance. And our plan does that in accordance with the CDC recommendations of six feet, ensuring high quality ventilation. As many of you know, every room has at least one. Some rooms have two air purifiers. And in addition to that, we invested a considerable amount of time and money in upgrading and, and repairing our systems before school started. We certainly teach children about respiratory and hand washing etiquette. And we do contact trace every positive case. And we've been very thorough with that. I do that with the school nurses, building principal and sometimes the athletic director. You folks know that that is completed when you get an email from me, but I'll tell you it's, it's very detailed and very uh, well documented. So why are we thinking about pool testing? Because we believe that it will increase safety. It will help us to identify asymptomatic cases in the schools. We hope that it increases confidence and trust in our, in our safety plan. And um, it helps us to kind of see what's happening in the schools, especially in relation to community transmission and to see if there's a relationship between community transmission and asymptomatic cases in the school, in the schools. The most important thing for folks to understand is that this is entirely voluntary for staff and for students and families. This week, at some point this week, you will receive all families will receive an invitation and consent form. These things can be done electronically. If there's any barrier to completing the electronic consent form, we'll work with families on that. So again, it is completely voluntary and people can rescind their consent at any time. There is no cost to families. And for the six, first six weeks, there is no cost to the district. After six weeks of pool testing, the district may use its COVID funds in order to um, continue the testing for as long as the district determines that it is necessary. And what are these, what is pool testing? So there are essentially two kinds of tests. There are diagnostic tests and um, antibody or serology tests. And under diagnostic tests, there are molecular tests and there are antigen tests. And the pool testing program actually uses both kinds of tests. Abbott Binix Now rapid test, which can deliver results very quickly, is used in the pool testing program when a pool comes back positive. And there'll be a diagram that shows kind of how the whole pool testing process works. Um, and the molecular testing is used as um, part of the initial pool testing, gathering pool testing samples. So this is really hard to see. I also sent this home in the weekly newsletter. But essentially how this works is that a pool of 10 specimens are collected. So we determine once we know who is interested in participating in this program, then we'll develop our pools and we'll develop um, our testing schedule the day of the week that we would test. And so every single student if they are old enough, they would self-swab, and these are called anterior nasal swabs. So at the end of this, Robin will demonstrate for folks what it looks like and what it feels like, but these are not, these are anterior nasal swabs, so they don't go very far um, into the nasal cavity. Uh, it's in the anterior part of the nasal cavity, each nostril swab three times, uh, I believe, and, um, and then the samples, the specimens are collected for very young children, they would get assistance, but the Department of Public Health has said that children from second grade up can be responsible for, collect, for doing their own swabbing. And we would certainly um, make a determination as to which students are comfortable and competent in doing their own nasal swabs. You collect 10 specimens in a pool and um, and each specimen is individual, is each pool then is tested and the individual results don't come back for that pool. So there are 10 
uh, specimens in a pool, individual results don't come back for a pool. The entire pool is tested. And if any one specimen, they're not individually identified, so they're not tracked to the individual person. If the pool comes back positive, then each individual within the pool would the following day, or if, if the test happened on a Friday, the next available school day, every person in the pool would come in simply to get an individual retest to make a determination as to whom with, who within the pool is positive. And then once that determination is made, we implement our quarantine, isolation, and contact tracing um, in accordance with all of our procedures. So how it works, first, parent, staff, sign a consent. Again, nobody is compelled to do this. It is entirely voluntary. Um, by signing the consent, you're consenting to not only the pool testing, but also you're consenting to an individual follow-up test, which is the Abbott Phoenix Now rapid testing. The information, you're also consenting to the fact that your information will be transmitted via technology. So the technology is secure. The reason that that's important is that if the pool comes back positive, the school needs to know which pool was positive so we can make sure that we get the right folks in to do follow-up testing. And once the testing starts, on their assigned day, the students will either swab themselves or they'll be swabbed. The swab will be placed into a pool test tube along with swabs from other students in the pooled group. 24 to 48 hours later, pool testing results would come to the school via the secure electronic portal. And if a student or staff member is in a pool that is negative, you don't hear anything. If a student or staff member is in a pool that is positive, then you're notified that you need to come in for a follow-up test. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Robin, talk a little bit more about this. I wanna say how much I appreciate Robin Sis and Allison Willette, two nurses who are also parents who have offered to step in and assist the district with these coordination efforts this really would not be possible without their help. Um, as straightforward as it might seem, there everybody here has a lot on their plates. And so without the help of these two wonderful individuals working with our nurses and supporting us in this, it just wouldn't happen. So Robin, I'll mute myself and turn it over to you. Thanks, Annie. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Robin Sis, and I've been a registered nurse for 16 years at Bay State Medical Center. And over the last year, I've had a lot of work experience with COVID-19, um, especially in the testing um, department and testing patients. So it's something that I'm very familiar with. I'm thrilled to join the district's pool testing initiative and help with the COVID-19 response within our schools. I think pool testing can help identify potential outbreaks early and it helps give our district um, the confidence to, to stay open. So I think that um, testing is a great thing and I'm really, really happy to um, be helping out. Um, we've learned a lot over the last year, especially over the last few months in regard to COVID-19. And I think we're all pretty aware that one of the major pillars in fighting this pandemic is, is testing. So I just wanna reiterate that um, even though we're doing this testing, and I know Annie just talked about this, it's really only just a piece to our response puzzle and all other mitigations, such as social distancing, masking up, hand hygiene, will remain in place in school and should remain in place outside of school. And as we wait for our vaccines, this extra testing will help add a protection, um, a layer of protection and reassurance to our staff families and ultimately our community. So I just want to take a few minutes and explain the procedure of how easy the pool testing is in obtaining the sample. Um, so like Annie mentioned, it's asymptomatic surveillance testing. It will occur once a week on the same day. The test itself is extremely gentle, non-invasive. It's a great way to test, especially um, it's open to staff and children, students but it's super easy, um, nothing to be afraid of. 
Um, like Annie mentioned, it's not the deep swab that everybody was talking about um, last year, the nasopharynx swab. It's just simply swabbing the inside of your nares, and I'm going to demonstrate that. Um, the staff can swab themselves. Most students can swab themselves, but the students that would have a difficult time maybe doing that or the younger ones, I'm certainly going to step in and swab for them. But everybody will be swabbing under mine and Allison's um, supervision. So you're not left alone. If you're nervous about it, I can do it for you. Um, we're there to help. The swab only takes about five to 10 seconds. And... I am going to go ahead and do that for you guys right now. So everybody will be wearing a mask already. So what we're gonna ask is, so we haven't really, we, we think we have the logistics down on like where we're going to test um, outside the classroom, more to kind of come on that. But um, the students or staff member in the pool would come up to myself and Allison. We would ask them to use some hand sanitizer. They're going to take down their mask with just myself and Allison right there. The swab is the size of a Q-tip and you're gonna swab three times, both nares. Put it inside a test tube. More hand sanitizer and off you go. And that is it. So really um, easy stuff. Not like the swabs people were talking about last year, how uncomfortable they are. This is not that. Um, we have figured out how to test people um, less invasively. So this is a really great thing. Once the swabs or specimens are collected from both schools that day, they'll be sent off to the lab for testing. The results will take about 24, I think to maybe 48 hours, but okay, yep, 24 to 48. And like Annie mentioned, if there's a positive pool, those individuals who are in that pool will be asked to stay home. They'll return back to get an individual PCR test and we will find out who in that pool is actually positive. That test comes back in 30 minutes. So we'll be calling you that day. If you're negative, you can return back to school. If you happen to be a positive, um, you'll stay home and you'll isolate and follow the DPH guidelines. And just to let everybody know, this is your personal information, the test results is completely confidential, um, meaning that it'll be shared um, I believe Annie with DPH, correct, the positive results, but in terms of the members in the pool, in the um, school community, nobody will know your information. Nobody will know who's positive or who is negative. That is confidential. Um, you will just get a phone call if you're positive or negative. There are a lot of districts statewide that are doing this um, pool testing. Com uh, communities are jumping on board. They see the value in testing. They want to reopen schools. They want to gain trust in their community. They want their schools to stay open, um, everyone to feel good about it. And just for an example, Watertown was one of the first towns to initiate this testing. And they started off with 50% of students district-wide doing this. And now they're almost close to 90% of students doing this testing. So um, I'm excited to help get the program going. I know Allison is as well, and um, I look forward to working with everybody. Thanks. And if folks, thank you, Robin, that was excellent. I'm gonna ask that you remain unmuted in case folks have questions. And Heather, I'm gonna ask for your assistance on the hand raise sure. and acknowledging so, people. So we would um, welcome at, at this part of the, the meeting, um, a question and answer. Uh, if, if folks have questions about the information that was just presented about pooled testing, um, please feel free to raise your digital hand. You can find it either at the bottom of your screen or in the participants pane. Sometimes it's, you have to click on participants and it's in the bottom there, but um, we'd welcome your questions 
And, uh, you know, again, then once I see that there's somebody that has a question, we'll ask you to come off mute and you can pose that question to uh, Robin or others here. And school committee, just so you know, you're deliberating about this later. Right. So I'll ask a question because I'm not seeing any come in yet from our participants. Uh, you mentioned you and thank you very much, Robin, for demonstrating what you would do uh, with a student in collecting a sample. Can you talk a little bit more about what you and Allison would then do with the samples in terms of handling those, storing those, um, transporting those? What happens next? Of course. Yeah, great question. Um, so Allison and I will be in um, PPE. Um, personal protective equipment. Um, so we'll be, um, everything will be safe with handling the specimens. Um, we're talking about ordering medication or medical carts to keep everything locked and all of our equipment together. I think right now we're thinking about going classroom to classroom and having the students who have consented to have the testing done step out of the classroom for just a minute or so, do the swab, put them in the test tubes. And once everything's collected, labeled, um, which Allison and I are very familiar doing as nurses, um, collecting and labeling specimens, they're then going to be, I believe, transported by Annie. Yep, to the lab. Mm -hmm. And the lab is where? I think in I think in Boston, is it in Boston? No, uh, oh, we, okay. uh, we, I believe we have a uh, local courier service. If, it, if it's not local, then we'll end up doing uh, FedEx on that as well, or courier service. So we have those two choices. Okay, thank you. I do see we have a question from the public, uh, Missy Aloisi. So I am going to ask you to unmute and you can come off on uh, mute, Missy, and ask your question. Hi there, um, it's Melissa Aloisi, and I think this is great. Um, I have a question about the sports. And so with pool testing, is the athletic director going to be made aware if a student participating in the school sports? You know, I'm just, my question is geared towards that in safety. Sure. Sure, Melissa. So I think if I'm not understanding your, your question correctly, let me know. But I think it's an excellent question. So just as we have with any sort of contact tracing, once we identify, so athletes who consent would be a part of the pool, just like any other student. If uh, that pool were negative, it would be, as excuse me, positive, as we had indicated that everybody would be told, you don't return to regular classes until we get the results back from the rapid test. And if an athlete were positive, we would treat it as we have to date. Um, we would contact trace just as we do with every other student. And yes, when it involves athletics, the athletic director actually has assisted us with our contract tracing efforts. Thanks for the question, Melissa. Uh, next, we have a question from Dan Wilga. I will ask you to unmute so you can come off of your, off of mute and ask your question. Hi, I'm sorry if uh, Annie explained this already and I misunderstood, but I just wanted to clarify that the after, if your pool comes back positive and you're going in for the retest, which you said was the Abbott in rapid, what's the procedure for the individual for the retest? Is it the same self swab or is it different? It's this. It's um. A, it, it's called a different test, but it's the same type of swab. Thank the, you. Yeah, no problem. And I encourage folks at home, especially with um the um, younger students, just take a Q-tip. If you're consenting to have them tested, you can just simply do it at home and let them know, you know, what it feels like. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Robin. Uh, Melissa, I see your hand is up again, so I, I, you may have another question. I will ask you to unmute. Great, thanks. Um, I'm wearing my Park and Rec director's hat right now. And my question is, I'm excited about this pooling and I'm wondering if town-wide, since Park and Rec's providing supplemental programming on site at the schools, if that is something that the DPH it, 
we'll be able to not share, but just utilize it so that way we can maybe provide more programming in the buildings. I think that's an excellent question, Melissa. What I would suggest is when the school committee deliberates, I don't know the answer, but if there's anything they want me to find out from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, it's a grant funded program, so there may be some stipulations on that, but they could certainly give me direction as to um, what, what are the limits and what are the possibilities of uh, expanding anything. Thanks, Annie. And maybe you can address this question. Um, oh, and Paul's got his hand up and I already asked a question. So Paul, go ahead. Just to be clear, <clears throat> I think Annie, you covered this, that this is completely voluntary, but so if I'm a parent and I choose not to have my child participate, I can still send my child to school. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, we cannot make um, in-person learning conditional and consenting to a test for COVID. We wouldn't, we can't do that. I'm not yeah. suggesting we wanted to, but if anybody thinks, oh, well, they change their mind at some point, it's it's not an option. Okay, just wanted to be clear, and thanks. It's completely voluntary, yes. Great question. All right, any other questions from the public on this? Okay. And we're look, it's a gold star for perfect timing. Perfect timing. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, we're right at six o'clock here. So excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Robin and Annie, for going over that. And I know I see Allison on the line as well here. So uh, thank you for your involvement in this activity. It's really uh, great to hear where we are. It's very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Robin. Again, I want to underscore this would not be happening if these two parents, these two women weren't willing to help us with these efforts. And you would not have gotten a demonstration if it weren't for Robin. I'm sure Allison would have been willing to do it too. But I said, I, I can't, I can't forever. I can't do it. <laughs> I'll do the testing, but I can't publicly demonstrate it. So thank you. No problem. Thanks. Great. Thanks. We're going to move now into public comment. Um, public comment, just a reminder, uh, we try to limit public comment to three minutes for each speaker. If you do have a public comment uh, on any of the items for tonight or anything that you would like to comment on for us to consider before we begin uh, our presentation and discussion items and our own deliberations, please feel free to uh, bring that to our attention. And you can do that by raising your digital hand again. And I will um, give folks a, a minute here just to see if there are any anyone interested in participating in public comment. Again, the digital hand, you can find that typically at the bottom of your screen along the toolbar or in the participants pane at the very bottom. Okay. Uh, Melissa Aloisi, you have a public comment. Let me click on ask to unmute and you should be able now to comment. Melissa? Great, I just wanted to uh, reiterate, I think it's great, the pooled testing. I think that'll help us move forward and as well as moving to phase three. Um, I am scared as a parent, but I think with the status of mental health that, um, there are more things we can do uh, outdoors now that the weather will be getting better. And um, that's my input as a parent. Thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate it. All right, seeing no other hands raised, then uh, again, I appreciate everyone's participation in the Q&A and in public comment. And we're going to move now to our presentations and discussion items. We have quite a few things on the agenda for tonight. We'll move first into the fall two athletics plan. Eric Sudnick is on. Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Heather. I uh, appreciate the time again tonight, all school committee members and Dr. McKenzie and other administrative staff. Um, so I hope this will be a quicker presentation for you being to the fact that we've done a fall sports presentation during the fall and I can just kind of reiterate and update on items that might've shifted. Um, I know we talked about soccer extensively during the fall and how it would look. And it's gonna look a little bit different. Uh, I don't know if you looked outside recently, but the weather is uh, not cooperating for soccer, outdoor soccer at this point. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about 
about that in a second. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share the plan. And again, I'll try and move through. I know you have a busy uh, night tonight. So I'll try and move it through it quickly and efficiently. Sorry, my computer's thinking. Are we able to see my screen now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. You can just blow up the document a little bit larger for the okay, for those, people uh, who need it, like myself, the large print version. I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, which button would I hit for that one? There's a 100% just below oh, your cursor there. there. Yeah. And yeah. you could just go up to 150. Try that. All right. There we go. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So, um as all the other plans uh that were presented on behalf of the athletic program this is following the mia uh desi guidance as well as the ea guidance that's continued to be modified and changed as we've moved along uh, throughout the year so this plan once again is specific to fall to athletics only uh there will be an additional season all well, if all goes according to plan and, and hopefully it will uh for spring athletics that won't begin till uh late april so the current dates for the fall two athletic plan uh, would go from March 1st um, all the way until April 25th, okay? Sports that we're looking to move forward with for this fall two season. Uh, we did the soccer clinics last fall uh, to some great success. I know people really appreciated us putting those on even though we were unable to offer uh, soccer games during the fall last, uh, last year. Um, so we're looking forward to moving with more of a traditional uh, practice and then game-based season. Uh, so girls soccer and boys soccer would be offered by the school. Um, swimming was approved for winter and uh, there was uh, so many hoops that especially the AD from Amherst, uh, Victoria Stewart jumped through to try and get swimming going during the winter. Uh, losing pools left and right, all sorts of logistical uh, stuff coming up. Uh, but in the end, um, it, they got to the point where it made, uh, made sense to try and move swimming to from the winter to a fall two setting, uh, which numerous schools ended up doing. So looking to move forward with swimming. Um, our original plan was to continue to co-op with Northampton for football. Northampton, uh, the town of Northampton is currently not allowing football to be played in their school district. Uh, so that's currently unavailable. Um, I'm still in discussions with the athletic director from Northampton and she's keeping me in the loop on any new any new items that might come up in regarding that. So um, if they do offer the opportunity, we would like to move forward with uh, participating in that co-op. But again, that wouldn't be a, uh, uh, available at this point. So, all right. So the participation in athletics remains the same as far as the expectations for each one of the previous plans. Um, we have modifications here based off practice and game spaces. So obviously with the weather right now, um, and we knew this going into it, that there was gonna have to be some sort of indoor uh, training that's going on for at least the majority of March into early April. So um, at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the season, teams would train indoors in the gym, uh, similar to how basketball trains with uh, JV and varsity teams training at separate times, trying to maximize the amount of space that we have for the, while limiting the number of athletes. And um, we would follow the same practice procedures that we did for the winter sports program. So I copied and put that into the document down here. Um, the game procedures would, uh, would obviously look different. I, I would need to modify that document if we were ever to practice do a game indoors for soccer. Uh, but for right now, I would just follow the practice procedures we had in basketball, which after students were um, aware of and aware of the expectations and the coaching staff were good. Um, worked quite smoothly. So it, it was good and people were abiding by their regulations and doing their best to maximize uh, the safety while participating indoors. Uh, when we have the opportunity to go outdoors, we're looking at using a few fields, uh, the varsity field beside behind the school, um, while still trying to stay off the recently redone and beautiful new area that we're going to have to stay off for an extended period of time. Um, but the varsity field, we should be able to fit a soccer field in uh, right alongside the baseball field. Uh, we would love to utilize the field between Hopkins Academy and the school on the corner of Russell and Middle Street there. That would be a good practice space as well as the elementary school field. Um, practice times and places uh, will obviously depend on uh, the number of levels 
the number of levels that we offer uh, depending on who signs up. So we won't be able to determine that until we have a better look at uh, what the size of the, the teams are going to be. As I said before, we'll get, I hope to field both of our student and JV team playing games um, at, eventually for both groups. Um, and we would continue to practice with a larger teams using the cohorts, separate amount of practice times. They can still do scrimmage events and stuff, but most of the time um, should be spent in kind of a cohort setting. Um, so that will continue to remain consistent. Uh, attendance of the athletes will continue to be tracked by the coaching staff. They've done an excellent job of doing that and using uh, some sheets that are provided or um, their own mechanisms and then getting me uh, copies of their attendance. And when needed, we've used those to do contact tracing protocols and it's worked very well. So we'll continue to do that. Uh, mod, this part is the same as previous, just uh, the EA guidelines just put into the document regarding uh, modif modifications. Um, this is a new piece that um, we ended up adding partly during the winter and we'll continue to look to do during the fall too. Um, season. Um, I developed a questionnaire that we have students fill out before each and every practice or each and every team event. And I put it in a document so that they go on and access the same document and they'll be able to fill out the questionnaire regarding uh, their health and how they're feeling for that day, right? So there's a series of questions regarding um, if they feel like they've had a fever or a dizzy or any sort of the symptoms that would be associated with, uh, a co you know, having possibly having COVID. So they're supposed to fill out the questionnaire each and every day, turn it in, and it will be documented each and every time they fill it out so that we have a, a recall on who's filled it out and that they've verified that they're feeling well enough to attend practice that day. So that's a new piece we've been adding, and it's gone pretty well. Continue we'll to do that going forward. I'll create one for each team. And again, it will be documented each time that somebody fills it out before each event. Uh, facilities will remain the same. This piece will remain the same. Um, the standards for whether indoor or outdoor will remain. Uh, moving down to soccer, which I was actually surprised to see that the soccer modifications had lightened a little bit from the fall. So uh, it was it was nice in a way in that it allowed the game to be a little bit more to the traditional way. Um, if you look down, um, there's still these are the modifications that would have to be implemented for the games when they take place. Uh, but I don't know, it's been a while since we've seen, but it, it is less than it was previously. Still enough there to try and maximize the safety um, and uh, make sure the student athletes are safe while participating. Um, but again, reduced from where it was during the fall. So, and I'll continue to work with the coaching staff on making sure we follow all these guidelines uh, when we are available to uh, have games. Uh, so look forward to that. Um, if we continue looking down, uh, this is just kind of a recap of the co-op sports. Uh, again, girls and boys swimming has been approved um, to move forward through this phase. So we'll look to continue that. And football is currently uh, on hold for this point. We'll continue to try and work through that if we can. Mask wearing expectations um, is the same as it was during the winter update that I gave everyone where everyone's required to wear masks at all times. Um, unless there's a, a good amount of distance between and you are outside, okay? Um, but for the most part, students are going to be required to wear the mask at all times during all parts of practice, unless they're extremely distant in a kind of a designated area, so. Uh, this section is the same as previous, uh, pre and post event modifications, uh, just for the expectations of remaining in vehicles, not arriving early to practice or to games. Um, the students and actually have done a really good job showing up the 15 minutes ahead of time um, and not too early before like a contest to make sure that, you know, we're minimizing the amount of people and the amount of interaction where we can. Um, they've been following these guidelines quite well and we'll, we'll continue to do so. Our opponents for the fall too, we remain the same. We've been able to keep in the, in the bubble um, with our local, mainly Franklin County schools and then Smith Academy. And it's gone quite well. Uh, the work I've done with the athletic directors and the communication we've kept up to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And there's, if there's an issue that there's immediate contact regarding anything that might come up in a school district has gone really well. 
and uh, we'll continue, continue to work with these schools. For soccer, we are looking to schedule eight games at this point. Um, there is no uh, tournament set up by the MIA for the fall two season. Um, there's no plan for a local tournament at this point, but that doesn't mean that that is entirely out of the question. Okay, a, a lot of that could depend on weather. We've been really originally talking about eight games, but um, depending on how the weather goes and depending on how things are moving uh, in and around the league, uh, it's subject to change, so we'll keep that fresh. As you might recall, for the winter season, we had originally planned on doing uh, a local tournament at the end, but as things shifted, we had to shift that expectation. So the same remains for the fact that maybe it could shift the other way and we could get something in. So we'll continue to try and work on all aspects of providing students an opportunity as we as we will move forward. So as far as spectators are concerned, we've, we've begun initial talks regarding allowing spectators at um, at games, we did not during the winter period uh, or during the fall. Um, this is something we want to give a lot of consideration to, especially if the guidelines shift and we can do it in a, in a safe way. We've been trying to work the live streams as best as possible. Um, I've learned a lot about live streaming personally and using uh, a video camera in the gym and, and figuring out how all that works. I think I've done all right, uh, but it really doesn't obviously replace uh, the in-person uh, viewing of a contest that I know people would really like to see. So I'm going to continue to talk to the other athletic directors in the league and continue to look at the guidelines as far as the, uh, the state is concerned. And um, if an opportunity makes sense for us to provide spectators or provide an opportunity for spectators, we'll continue to look at that and, and provide that opportunity if we think it, it makes sense for um, the program and the school system. Um, so if we are able to provide an opportunity, it would there would be limitations to the amount of adults who would attend and our siblings who would attend. Uh, we would have socially distant um, areas marked off where people could safely watch the game. And there would be a series of contact tracing protocols I would have to put in place on who we knew was showing up from either home schools only or home and visiting schools. And everyone would be contact traced and have contact information in case um, they need to be uh, follow through on. So, um, as I said before, we're going to continue to work with Hadley Media to tape or broadcast the events or live stream on our own YouTube channel that we've set up and has been working, I think, pretty well, all things considering. Uh, away games and transportation will re would remain the same. As always, there's an athletic student transport form um, that we have for families if they choose to want to transport their student athlete to an away game. Uh, we if they choose to fill out that form, it doesn't mean their student can't take public the public transportation, um, but it would simply be an option for them to transport their student if they chose to. Okay, so it wouldn't prohibit them from taking the school bus. And um, last but not least, uh, contact tracing, as I've referred to before, we always at each event make sure we have the names and contact information for everyone in attendance. Um, when we've needed to practice the contact tracing, it has worked very effectively. I would like to thank um, publicly Dr. Uh, McKenzie, uh, Principal Camuso, and uh, our nurse and master tutorial for all their help with any contact tracing um, situations that have come up. Um, we do it out of an abundance of caution and it has worked uh, when it was necessary to do so and we'll continue to look to have that safety protocol in place. So, All right, another than that. That would be it as far as my screen share. Let me hit the stop share button here. Thanks, Eric. I don't have any questions regarding the fall to athletics plan. Yeah, so this is not an action item for our committee, but um, are there any questions for Eric? Yeah, thanks, Eric. This is Paul. Um, good job. Um, so you mentioned the varsity field potentially. Is there space? Just remind me, I can't remember how far out the, the new so, side Yeah, goes. so we should be able to fit a field. Even if it wasn't to the full extent of the varsity field, we could do a, a slightly smaller field on the varsity space. If I, I went out and walked the area a bunch of times, I actually loved walking the walking path uh, multiple times this fall. And I would often go in around the field and check where the area was that we would still be able to utilize for this year. We could fit a field uh, in, in that space or right next to the baseball field. The yeah. softball field on that side where the JV field traditionally was, 
uh, that would not, there's not enough room over there. Um, so we'd stay away from that. So it would be about utilizing the game field there and staggering games, staggering practices, figuring out a way to make it work. Um, I also want to be sensitive to the uh, Cal Ripken and anyone using the baseball fields at the elementary school. Um, they're going to be using those this spring, and I'm working with the Cal Ripken Association to make sure that we're not impeding or undermining things they're trying to do over there. So I have to be careful about what sort of setup we put over there, but we could probably utilize it for place at, um, for points of, for practice. So it's going to be logistically working things out, but I think we can make it work. Yeah, thanks. Yep. And I will just give you a shout out for the live stream for basketball. It's, you know, it doesn't replace being in there, but it's just it's a good second. So thanks. 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 So I think yeah, folks sure. like Heather, Hadley Media helped, Hadley, Heather Siaglo helped, Donna Berg. Yes. So, so Hadley yeah. Media, um, they were able to get, they they were trying to make get their camera to function. There was an issue with the live stream connecting to the school um, workings, right? The, the hot spots in the school and everything. And what I was doing was actually taking the camera and going through my laptop, which is already connected to the school and doing it that way. So ours was a little more user friendly to figure out, um, but Hadley Media recently figured out how to do it and I was able to live stream the other day. So we actually had two live streams going, one through the Hopkins Live, Sports Live that we set up and then one through the Hadley Media. So trying yeah. to do it where we can and, and get everyone to view the games. And for those who aren't aware, the games aren't only live streamed, but if you go to the Hopkins Sports Live channel, they'll be saved on, on the YouTube and you can you can watch them at any time. So you can go back and look at them. Yeah, thank you. I guess I'd just make a pitch that we could have some managed spectators. I mean, it's gonna be outside, not wouldn't wanna go out anytime soon, but um, you know, be outside and I'm sure we could all put lines on the ground to keep us all six feet apart and just in our family pods. I think we yeah, can do it safely. I know it would make a big difference to the kids to have other people out there. That was, that was the hope when we talked at one of our previous uh, Franklin County League meetings is that uh, we think with the shift to being outside for the games and everything with all the, the changes in EA guidelines um, that we could probably give making uh, or give spectators a go at the, at the event. So we're going to continue to look at that. Uh, we have some time to work through that obviously with the, the weather. We're going to make sure that we're taking care of the practices, get the students in shape and making sure they're set for games. And then um, once the weather cooperates, we'll work through um, game-based issues, so. Great, thanks. Yep. Any other questions from folks? Me neither, thanks, Eric, really appreciate it. Oh, I think somebody had a question. They had their hand raised. Uh, we have a question from the public, um, we are I, I hate to say it, but we're past public comment at this point. Oh, okay. So I would encourage you, uh, Michael Gallo O'Connell, if you'd like to send an email um, to Eric directly or to any one of us, we're happy to get that answered for you. Okay. Thanks, all Eric. Right. Thank you very much for all your time today. Take care. Yeah, thank you. We're now gonna move to the second uh, presentation item. Celebrating 12th and 6th graders in 2021, Ms. Camuso, Ms. Dowd. Yes. So this will be, I'll prepare people, this will be brief because we don't know a lot right now. What's important is that the public knows that we are thinking about it. And I just want people to know, I know how hard last year was. It was incredibly hard, particularly around graduation. It was incredibly disappointing for families and for students. I think it is helpful to remember we're in a very different place right now. Almost in about two weeks, it'll be one month, right? Friday, March 13th, we walked out of the doors and the governor said, see you in two weeks. It's about a year ago. And so we thought we were just gonna come back in two weeks and things unfolded in ways that we didn't completely um, imagine or foresee. And now we're in a very different place, but I'll turn it over to Ms. Camuso and Ms. Dowd to just say, to to um, ensure everybody that we are thinking and planning um, to the best of our ability with the limited information we currently have. Sure, um, Ms. Camuso, if you wouldn't mind, I'd go first, um, sure. just to give an update on the sixth grade uh, celebration notes that I have so far. Historically speaking, the sixth grade celebration has been a parent run activity uh, with support from the school. Last year, due to the closing, parents hosted a Zoom event 
uh, with pre-recorded presentations and it was lovely, but it was not what we had all hoped for at the end of, of last year. Um, this year, we have not received any interest yet from the sixth grade parents. And I think a lot of that has to do with the circumstances surrounding the COVID restrictions and the uncertainty of what our options might be in the spring. Um, but the good news is uh, myself and my incredible um, administrative assistant both have sixth graders. And so we have been talking a lot about facilitating some type of event, um, given what what restrictions we might potentially have. Um, ideally, if we were allowed to invite families to an outside event in the spring to celebrate our sixth graders, that would be fantastic. That's what our, our hope would be, um, so that we were able to invite families to an outside event, uh, masked, um, and coordinate speeches and pictures for families and their students. We typically only have um, each student invite two adults per household to, to attend um, the sixth grade celebration. Um, so that would still be in place and we would be outside and we'd be able to adhere to the gathering restrictions, whatever they might be in the spring. If we're unable to host an event at the school, we'd still like the option of a virtual celebration that we can host like we did last year um, or do some type of streaming like basketball um, and have an event at the school for staff and the sixth graders since they're already naturally cohorted. And we could live stream that to any families that wanted to come in um, and to, to view that rather um, from the luxury of their home. Um, so that's an option as well. Uh, but again, a lot of this is wait and see. Um, we've all been living kind of week to week, month to month. Um, our hope is that we will be able to have um, a, a stronger sixth grade celebration in that we would all be able to be in person in the same space. But we are thinking forward, we are hoping that we'll have that as an option. And if not, we will pivot and try to make um, that day and that event special for our sixth graders and their families. Thanks, Jennifer. Sorry, Tiffany. Second to unmute myself. So I have a few different things to cover in regard to the seniors and graduation. And as was already shared, there's no one selection made yet, but we do have different ideas depending on what things look like at the time. So for example, we have three different graduation scenarios which will depend on what we're allowed to do. One of those is an outdoor graduation, which is what I know the students, and I assume the families, but I know that know for sure that the students wanna have at Hopkins. In order to do that in a meaningful way though, that does mean that we would have to have up to 250 people outside. So again, that will depend on what's allowed at the time. Um, and then that's pretty easy to do. I can actually, let you know that in terms to your soccer question about the fields, there is one space there that's 225 feet by 290 feet. So I think almost the size that you need for a field. It's a, a pretty good chunk. So Mr. Mitch and I already measured that out. There's a nice L shape there. So there's plenty of space to have that with people outside. It's just whether or not we can have that many people in one space. I know that Desi is working on releasing guidance around graduation and we're expecting that in the next few weeks. Right now we're thinking about having students graduates stay with their families um, and then go up from there. Again, some of that will depend on what the guidance is at the time. If students are allowed to be closer to one another, then it might make sense to space them out on a stage. The stage rental is uh, pretty easy and affordable. We also have the audio equipment that we need, so no real concerns there. That does involve a rain date though, obviously, since we can't control the weather and be outside in the pouring rain. So that is a consideration to think of as well. We have another scenario, which is a smaller, simple receiving of the diploma across the stage. And then a third one, which is essentially similar to last year involving a recorded graduation and a parade. So obviously we're hoping for the outdoor graduation. Um, hopefully that can work out for us. Similarly for class night, we have two options. One is a virtual option. And then another one is an option potentially in the gym. Um, there are some complications with that. It does limit the number of family members who could attend. Usually friends and other students get to go as well, just like with graduation and they could not, it would be a smaller group of people so to make that happen in a meaningful way. You have to have 150 people indoors allowed at the time. So again, right now that, that wouldn't be possible. So that may or may not work. 
But either way, we have the two different options. And then there is some complexities around the projector in the gym, uh, but we can likely work that out. I know that one of our students shared that they had some challenges with that around robotics, um, which some of you might recall. So we'll see based on where things are at the time where that ends up. Seniors also have a lot of other activities that some of you might recall in their last week. I will be sending an email out to seniors soon to remind them that even though their last day of classes is the 21st, they still have activities to show up to Monday through Friday the entire next week. So those will be a variety of different things, but one of those, for example, will be their class trip. Right now they're thinking about doing a class trip at Hopkins, kind of like a I don't know if field day is the right word, but I'll say a field day of sorts at Hopkins doing some different activities and they're looking at holding a banquet at the Young Men's Club so they can be in that outdoor pavilion and having that catered. So those things seem pretty doable um, for us right now, even under the current restrictions. So we're pretty confident that we'll be able to move forward with some things that are as normal as possible for our seniors and in, in celebrating what's happening with them. We did have students come in and decorate their class boards as well. So there were some seniors who came in and they were decorating their class board, which was kind of fun. Um, but we'll just see as it gets closer as to what's going to be more doable. And again, I'm interested to see what Dusty shares in terms of their guidance, because I believe that Dusty is leaning towards a more regular graduation as well. So I'm interested to see what that guidance will reveal. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? None for me, thank you, April. Hey, April, if I could just chime in this, this Paul. Um, one thing to think about it, I know you're just considering all the options and maybe this, you said this and I missed it, but the, the parade I thought was really great last year um, and it was a way for the community to come out. And even if we are allowed to have an, uh, graduation in the field, for example, I imagine it's going to be limited to immediate family. So you might consider doing a parade regardless of what else happens, just because um, it is a good way for all the community folks to, to get out and congratulate the seniors. Yeah, Annie and I will be talking about that a little bit more later this week. Um, so I can update you about that again after we talk. And we might sort of similar to the sixth grade celebration, be looking for some community partners to help with that rather than having uh, that just be something that the school does if we are throwing an in-person graduation. But we will follow up on that. I actually had a question for Jen, if you if you could address, um, will there be the step up day for sixth grade? We're planning, we're in planning for that. Um, obviously, we're, uh, my hope, my love would be to be able to have the kids take a bus and at least see the school. Um, again, I don't know if that's going to be a possibility. Um, I would like to host some kind of um, event so that sixth grade families can meet some staff members at Hopkins and be able to see the school. Um, but I'm working with April Camuso around that. And, and hopefully, as we get closer, I would love for the kids to be able to actually see Hopkins and be able to meet with some of the students as well. Um, our seventh and eighth graders um, maybe have some kind of reach out where they're um, able to speak with our sixth graders. Um, and if that has to happen over Zoom, that would be fine as well. But again, as we get closer, I really, um, I'm hoping to make those traditional things that we've been able to offer our students come to life for them. Thanks. So Step Up Day has historically not been for parents, but rather just for students. Just for the students, yeah. So in light of that, uh, it's actually, it sounds to me like it's a value add, a benefit to including the parents in the, um, in, in understanding what Hopkins presents as a value proposition. So it sounds to me like you could potentially um, achieve both things, that students might be able to access some understanding of an access, you know, of educators and classrooms and be inspired potentially by Zoom and that parents could potentially have that as well. Uh, I would imagine that if I were a parent thinking about not sending my kid from Hadley Elementary School to Hopkins, that that would be a big benefit. I think that's a, a good point. I will say there's sort of three different things that we're talking about. So we are right now in the process of starting registration. So sixth graders will be meeting with the middle school teachers to go over what some of the courses are that they offer. Then they'll go through registration. Step up day traditionally is for students to go through their schedule and gather their summer homework. 
And then we hold a new student reception in August, which parents often attend uh, with the peer mentors and they can get tours of the school and learn more about it. So pretty much by the time that step of day already happens, most parents and students have already made those decisions. So I think your idea is great humor and taking advantage of what we can virtually. Um, it's something that we would probably wanna do before then. We'd wanna do in March and April. So I'll make sure to touch base with the leadership team about that. I know, like I said, we're offering some things for the students in March to have some of those conversations. And you guys will see in a couple of weeks, we've worked hard to revise our program of studies to include a lot of what we're offering program-wise. Um, but I'll talk to them more about what else we can offer in terms of like an orientation or here's everything we have to offer for the, the families as well, because that is always a conversation that we have and we want to retain as many students as possible. So thank you. Thanks. Great. Any other questions on um, 12th and 6th grade celebrations and recognition? All right. Well, we look forward to hearing more and seeing that guidance from DASI. So thanks so much, April and Jen. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to move on then back to April on the update of phase three at Hopkins. Thanks. So we are wrapping things up in terms of preparing for phase three. We have dividers in place in our cafeteria and our library. We have whiteboards ordered for all of those extra rooms. We have the desks in place and set up, sanitizer, all of those things that we need in order to have all of our students back. We have heard back from almost every family and uh, my administrative assistants did reach out to families they didn't hear back from in order to find out about whether or not students will return in order to develop cohort assignments for students. So we're pretty much ready to go in terms of moving to phase three. A lot of that information that students and parents need, I have ready to sort of hit send on once we have the approval to move to phase three. Um, so they'll get that information, including a separate individual email, which would tell them which cohort they will be in so that they know where to go. Um, there's some other changes we need to make as well to their schedules in terms of knowing which classroom they're going to be in. And as we finalize those numbers, we'll finalize that in School Brains as well. But I was hoping to be able to talk a little bit about that move. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can have that set for March 1st. I know that's one of the things that I think you guys are looking to approved tonight. So if anyone has any questions about phase three, I'm happy to answer those. Um, I think we're in a good place for that. So the school's ready to go whenever you guys are. Thanks, April. So yeah, this is an action item for us to um, vote on a, approval to progress to phase three at Hopkins. And um, Tara, I think you came off mute. Do you have any questions? I was just curious how many uh, students are going to be back for phase three. Ooh, that might take me a second. I gotta I have to look at one of my documents. We do have students, so you might remember we gave them the option to be remote during the off week. So we do have students who will be in person the whole time, just like we do now. And then we do have students who took advantage of being remote. Let me just see. It might take me a second to add this up so I could give it to you more accurately at the end. Um, but I can tell you each grade. And if someone wants to add that for me, I could also tell us the grades and I'll get my calculator out. <laughs> That's a great question. I should have added it up, but I was so focused on just setting the cohorts in the groups. I didn't add the entire total, but it is a good, uh, good number overall. We have one grade that had a, a little bit less students, but we have, so seventh grade, for example, we have 24 students returning as of right now. And then in eighth grade, we have 31. In ninth grade, 29. 10th grade is 24. 11th grade is 19. And 12th grade is 29. So for most grades, the majority. 156 is what I got. Yes, that, that, sounds, that sounds about right. And right now we have maybe 35 to 40 kids uh, left. I think that the average in phase two is probably closer to 50 or 60, but once we hit the holidays and then return from being remote, we didn't see our numbers go back up in that same way. 
Okay. So so remind me the March 1st, it's going to start and it's, there's a, that week of phasing it in. Is that right? Yeah. So starting on March 1st, if we, if we started then each day, you would have a grade level join us. So seventh grade and then Tuesday would be seven and eight. Wednesday would be seven through nine. They stay cohorted that entire time. They start the day with an assembly for me to go over the school protocols and then they go to their cohort classroom where they stay during the rest of that time and get familiar with the school building and the protocols and the setup. They don't start moving face-to-face -face in their classes until March 9th, which is a Tuesday because seniors come back on a Monday, the 8th. And during that week, it's only seventh and eighth grade moving. So that number that we just said, 156, we don't have that many students in the building at one time because again, some students are going to be not in the building during their off week. So when grades seven and eight are moving, the students in nine through 12, some of them have indicated that they'll be home. So we've set up the cohorts so that students that will be there the entire time will be cohorted together so that we're not mixing those uh, two different cohorts. And then students that will be coming and going will be in other groups as well. So then March 15th, nine through 12th they'll move. Correct. Seventh or eight. okay. Yeah, and one of the documents I have to send out gives uh, families the first few weeks of what that looks like, both in like a list of these are the dates and blocks, and then in that visual so you can see which blocks will meet face to face and where those are in the schedule. Because it is kind of a lot. I do know that. It gets, it gets easier as you sit with it, but it is a lot to kind of manage. April, I'm interested in the, um, the percentage. So some more math, I guess. Uh, we're going from 20% in person to what percent? And I think that math is what Heather just said, 156 divided by, is it 250? Yeah, it's roughly 62% of the students. 62. But as April said, they're not all together. The 62% right. who have indicated that they would be there, but not 62% of the student body in any given week. Right. They could be if they wanted to be, but they didn't all choose that. So it's more likely going to be something short of that. Uh, can you estimate? Yeah, so during the seven and eight week, um, for example, we have middle school when they're there, we have 24 students who stay during their off week. And in high school, we have... 37. So similar to what our current uh, or our average phase two numbers are. And when I look at the students that say that they're remaining, it's the majority of the same students that we saw during phase two as well. So the net of it is that it'll be 50 or 62% of that grade, but the other grade will be 20 something percent. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, April, tell me if I did this right. So if you told me that I have seventh and eighth graders, 24 and 31 seventh and eighth graders who are participating, and of the ninth through 12th graders, 37 said that they were going to be there in their off week. So 24 plus 31 plus 37, so roughly I'm around 90 kids, 90 divided by 250 is about 36%. Is that what you're asking, Himera? On a given week, like how many kids are actually there? Yes. So the total student body, it looks more like a third. Did I do that right, April? I believe, yes. So, so in essence, we've gone from 20% to a third. In a well, I, I think you have to do the math with either cohort, right? Yeah. Whether the cohort is that, that's in seventh and eighth, which is mm -hmm. 55 versus, you know, right. 100 mm -hmm. with the ninth through 12. Right. And it will be more for the high school too. So when the high school is doing their movement, there will be more kids back in the classroom because they've got more grades. Right. Yeah, so when the high schoolers are there, it looks more like 50%, right, roughly. I am hoping, too, that as students are back and they're moving through their classes, it encourages other students to come back and attend in their classes as well. Um, but, you know, having a little bit smaller to start will also get people into that rhythm, I guess. That's one way to look at it. But we'll have to see how it goes. Um, I have one more question. Is everybody still six feet apart? Yes. That's why we have those other spaces. So all of our larger classrooms 
were moved to either the band room, the cafeteria, which is split into two classrooms. That's why we have dividers down the middle uh, or the library. Those were all turned into classroom spaces. And then the gym is used as a classroom for band and chorus and for a computer science class. And then other than that, it's used as a half of it's as a cohort space and the other half is for Eric if he needs to be inside with his class. So it's not used as much of a classroom. April, will you be including in your documentation about how families who are, are choosing not to be part of phase three in person can reach out and be part of phase three in the future should they change their mind and want to have their child come back in person? Yes, yep. I will include Great. a couple of sentences about it. It's the same process as phase two. It just, you know, depending how many people it is and how quickly it might take a couple of days to sort out the numbers. But right now we're not moving the assigned classrooms that we have. So we've assigned all of the new spaces based on the maximum number of students returning. So a teacher might be seeing less students and they might be able to stay in their original room, but we're not going to change those assignments until a little time has passed because it's a, a lot more work to have to try to change it back. So we're just gonna kind of leave it where it is so that we know we have that as an option in case more students do attend. That's great. I think it's just for families to know that, um, especially if, as you said, uh, as more kids come back um, and other kids want to come back, that families understand, you know, the process for that and that they don't have to necessarily wait until the next phase. Correct. April, when you first presented us with the phase three plan, you shared what uh, learning could look like for those who chose to remain in person uh, at remote. Um, has anything changed or shifted or any other updates on that front? I'm not sure if anything has changed or shifted. I think departments and teachers have been working on that. There's, again, a lot of variables. So, for example, we only have about half of the juniors attending. And so for people who primarily teach juniors, right, they're trying to sort out what am I going to do? Because I have literally half my class in person and half my class not. I have told them that they can use their discretion around that, but students who are attending face-to-face -face should be getting some sort of face-to-face -face instruction, right? They're in the school. They shouldn't just be sitting in front of the computer. I know, for example, one of the teachers talked about partnering up uh, the student who was in person at the lab bench with a student who's at home, so setting up their computer so that they can be working with that student in that space. I did provide teachers with an additional set of resources and guidance. So a long time ago, but in back in August, we went over some original expectations and suggestions around that, including um, some guidance around teacher recorded instruction and things like that to deliver. So I reshared that with all of the teachers gave them some other resources about how to incorporate students at home with students in person. Um, but it is just a continual process because every subject's different, who they're gonna have in their classroom, you know, numbers wise is gonna be different and they haven't done it before. So it's a lot of trial and error and I've just made sure that they know it's okay. It's a safe place to, to figure out how to do this totally new thing. Um, and I'm confident that, that they'll do a great job. Great. One thing I'd like us to consider, and I don't have any set expectations or recommendations around this yet, but I, I think for students who um, are doing remote um, education and doing it um, well, um, I think that sometimes it can seem really punitive that they're not exactly in their seat for from 7.40 to 12 o'clock um, and exactly coming into Zoom at that like magic moment. Uh, I know there's a lot more wiggle room that we've built in, in terms of mask breaks that are happening. It's very in-person centric, of course, right? It's mask breaks and moving it in the halls, but I just think that we could um, we could think about student learning outcomes and what they're actually achieving better, especially in an environment where half or more of the students are actually in person. 
Um, and I don't think that necessarily implies that you are, um, are, are not expecting the student there every moment. But I just think that, um, I think that when you have an expectation that the student has to be exactly in front of Zoom and clicking a button and being like in that space every 20 minutes, there, um, it's, it feels punitive, especially when that student is actually doing the work and following along. So I just want us to think about how that might work. Kumara, I'm not sure I totally understand your comment. Is it around when once we have more folks in person that there be more lenience for the Zoom, uh, for the, sorry, just Zoom on my brain today, for the remote attendees or? Yeah, I think it's gonna vary. There's some expectation that the students might not have to be there um, for, you know, given what we were shown about phase three, um, there's some expectation that they may not have to patch in. And then there are other teachers that might expect that they are there at that moment in time. And I can't even tell you the mo like how many tardies I've gotten for a kid that has been on honor roll for the first time in his entire life. Um, so it, um, I just, I, I, I don't know how to reconcile that necessarily, but in typical online education in the world at large, uh, there is more flexibility that comes from being an online learner, receiving instruction, doing the work, showing up and uh, presenting, but it's, it's not like regular school where the bell rings and if you're on the outside of the front door, you're late. And if you're on the inside, you're not. It, I think there, we just have to think more deeply about what, um, what feels uh, appropriate for a kid that's being asked to sit in front of a computer for four hours. Yeah, I think the only thing I would, um, I guess, caution us on with this conversation is in thinking about phase three model where you've all turned you're, gonna, you're allowing the kids who are coming in person in that cohort to be, and I see my internet connection is unstable, sorry. You're allowing them to be at home at remote the off week, right? And so I wouldn't want to be disruptive to our educators too in having different expectations on that off week than we do on the on weeks for remote attendees. So I would just I, and I understand um, your comment now, Humera. I just, I think that that may be a, a larger discussion in terms of either, you know, rethinking now that you have more folks in person about the expectations of remote participation, especially on those off weeks where those in-person, uh, that in-person cohort is no longer in the classroom. And I don't know that all of them aren't gonna be in the classroom, but I would think that some of them have chosen uh, to remote learn on the off weeks. Kind of to tack into that and maybe sort of a little different than what you said, Heather. I don't know, maybe it's a combination of everything. Um, but, you know, I, I think to the same extent, because you're going to have kids kind of back and forth quite a bit, at, at least in the beginning, um, I think we should also try to think about maintaining consistency for the kids who are home doing remote learning all the time. I know that can look different when we've gone from, say you have a remote learner, say, say I'm a remote learner all the time, but now our school has gone into full-time remote learning and that can look really different when everybody's remote learning. So that remote learner who's consistently remotely learning might have a different um, schedule that one week versus the week that everybody's home remote learning and that so from from the opposite perspective of you know trying to keep it consistent for the kids that are in person and at home I would want to this is complicated how, how can we keep it consistent and least disruptive for the kids who are also remote learning all the time so that's a I don't know how you're gonna get I don't know how you do that but I just you know just in thinking about our remote learners too, we wanna to make sure that we're able to provide some sort of consistency for them too. 
I think these are helpful questions. Some of them are, are similar to what teachers have also asked. There is an expectation that students will all log in even if they are remote at the start of class and teachers will take attendance. So teachers have similarly asked, you know, how am I gonna take attendance for the online kids and the ones in person? And, you know, they have to walk slower in the hall. So is two minutes gonna be enough? And it's probably not. So they're just gonna have to figure out what that is realistically and build that time into their lesson. So there will be, as we're sort of navigating this, that flexibility. We're not gonna change the whole schedule to say, well, we think it's gonna take this much time. We did a similar thing a few years back when we changed our schedule and we changed the passing time. And so for a while, we just tested it to see how long it actually took. And so teachers will be doing a similar thing because it is a little, little complicated to navigate. Students come in, they have to clean the desks in this space. The teacher is taking attendance in those two areas and making sure they're cleaning the desks in the space. Teachers are also moving some of their rooms. So you have to also account for some of that time. So it will be a little bit of a transition. And ultimately what you're judging them on is not necessarily how much time they are in a seat staring at a computer, but rather how well they've understood the lesson and interacted with the educators and their peers. So uh, attendance taking at a specific time isn't the same as it used to be. And so I, I just, I'm suggesting that we're mindful of that, especially as there's so much movement between um, who's in person and who's not. And I like the way Tara, you phrased it. There's a constituency that is consistently uh, at home and what does their user experience look like? I have one more thing to say that's unrelated, but I don't want to sh cut this short if we're still talking about. Good. Um, I just, um, if there's some way to put out, I know that, you know, Annie every week in her emails and her superintendent weekly emails, um, puts out some great information and reminders and maybe just a, a reminder to students and parents of kids that are gonna be coming back for phase three that we have absolutely fabulous mitigation strategies put into place in the schools, um, but they only work if people are practicing um, safety procedures at home and in the community as well. So just a reminder that we can have everything that we need to in place, um, but we're only as good as we're able to do it in the community as well. So reminding people to practice safe protocols at home, practice mitigation strategies, and don't stop now um, just because things are starting to look good. It can be um, encouraging and it can, it can feel exciting to see the trend the way that it's going. But I think that that's more reason to remember that it's going that way because of mitigation strategies, the vaccine becoming available and to keep up, um, you know, everything you can do safety wise at home and in the community to ensure, cause again, um, to ensure that our schools can stay open. That's the goal, keep them open. So do everything we can at home and in the community to keep us open. Those are great reminders, Tara. I'd just like to say thanks to you, April, and to Jen, you know, your, your teams for entertaining this and coming up with creative solutions. Um, I'm familiar with another school in our locale, and um, they just did a survey of the teachers, and 85% of the high school teachers said they weren't willing to entertain going back. So I really appreciate our folks being so um, thoughtful. Yeah, agreed. So I, I support this if we have to take a vote. Uh, Heather, are we ready to do that? Yeah, we do need to take action on this. I'm gonna ask the committee, are folks ready to um, take action on phase three or is there any other presentation or discussion item folks need to hear first? I know we have a number of them tonight mm -hmm. around data and um, CDC guidance, et cetera, but if folks are ready for phase three, uh, are we good to move forward with a, a motion? I am. Okay, I'm seeing nodding. So is there a motion then to approve progressing to phase three at Hopkins Academy? So moved. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? 
Sorry, I, I was spacing out thinking about something. Um, <laughs> April, can you just give us an update on how it goes that first week? Um, and I know we've done, you know, staff feedback after we've transitioned into phases, just getting an update on how that moves going at our next school committee meeting, how things are looking. And then also keep us um, posted on everything that Humera brought up about um, remote learners and how that's looking and maybe um, even, you know, reaching out to remote learners and getting their thoughts on how things are going as well. If we can just get an update on those at the next meeting. Sure, I'm not, I will certainly be here and update as much as I can on the 8th. At that point, students won't have been moving through classes and we'll just be having students return, but I'll, I can come back on the 22nd as well and, and give a, a deeper update at that point. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, it would be great too in the future to get uh, you know, some student voices uh, to hear from some students as well. I'd love to hear their perspective of how things are going. Great. All right. Well, thanks, um, I mean, Heather. I just wanted to take an opportunity to jump in just for Hadley Elementary School because I know there's going to be some questions about what does phase three look for uh, look like for us, and really just for my families to let them know that it's just adding more children into the building. Um, we're currently at 210 children at EPS, um, with 41 being remote. Um, an additional five or six are coming back um, March 1st. And so that will reduce our uh, remote learner numbers down to 37. Um, I had a meeting two weeks ago with my remote families. I had a, a parent conference and it was very successful. So I encourage um, April to do that as well, just to invite those families in to have a Q&A of how things are going. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that because I know I'll get peppered with questions as to our phase three and what that might look like. I do have to update our overall document of phase three because technically we're just adding more students in. Got it. And that will start March 1st as well. Correct. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, I think we're ready to move then to the next, uh, which is the Gazette request on a story regarding Hadley Public Schools approach to school reopening. Annie. Uh, yes, so the Gazette has reached out to me and would like to do a story, a bit of a spread on Hadley Public Schools, our approach, um, because they think it's quite sound. So I'll underscore again, and we'll get to this after uh, Ms. Dowd and Ms. Camuso talk a bit about school choice slots, but the committee and the reopening teams, which was the union, the school administrators, and our school nurses and the school committee were incredibly prescient. You really could have written the CDC guidance that just came out a couple of weeks ago. And the Gazette would like to uh, do a story on that. They would also like to take some pictures. They're always very good about maintaining student privacy. So they do kind of back shots and things like that. But I wanted to let folks know that we do have a no visitors rule, but know that pest control people come into our buildings. We're talking one reporter, Scott Mersbach, and uh, Carol, the photographer from the Gazette. Um, and probably toward the end of the day, they just like to get some general shots of showing what, what things look like. If the school committee has any reservations about that, let me know. Otherwise, I would call the Gazette and set up times for them to interview me members of the reopening team, potentially reach out to members of the school committee and come in for um, uh, some photos. No concerns for me. I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, as with the Gazette's been kind to us, um, and uh, I'm sure you'll manage the opportunity um, well. Um, but yeah, I think we've really done things um, done things well. And you're right, um, the CDC. Um, guidance that just came out almost mirrors like how did we know uh, that these were exactly the things that should have been done but uh, we're lucky in many respects um, due to our size and our ability to you know our our, um, our teachers association and um, various factors that allow us to execute on this plan so I think it would be a nice bit of visibility Great. Okay. I'll give them a call tomorrow. Okay. School and, choice uh, 
Yeah, so I'm going to share my screen, and I think at the top is Hadley Elementary. So again, you can review uh, the slots that are opening up, and this is great. Hopefully, the Gazette article draws a whole bunch more school choice, and for the school choice families who are listening this evening or on this Zoom call, every time we put school choice slots on the agenda, people get afraid that somehow we're going to rescind them. I just always want to remind people, anytime the school committee deliberates, once you're in school choice, we don't we don't take it away from you. Um, this is every year the school committee is required to vote as to whether or not they will participate in school choice and how many slots they're going to open up. So I will share this. And thank you to our school choice family. You now make up just over 20% of our total student body and uh, it wouldn't be Hadley Public Schools without you. So thank you for choosing Hadley Public Schools and uh, please encourage your friends to do the same thing. So here, Jen, I think, yeah, I'm looking at elementary on the top. You know, walk us through the slots. People can see the slots that are available. I don't know, folks, I should put it this way. If the school committee has any questions about class sizes or what's being opened up and why. So as you guys can see, um, we have our current um, enrollment numbers. So this is not the current grade, but what the current grade will look like next year. So when you're looking at kindergarten, that would be first and so on and such. Um, we have um, several slots that are open per um, grade level. We've really been thoughtful about people have, who have already shown interest in our school. And I do have to say, um, really mid-year, we had a lot of requests of, of families that really wanted to explore Hadley um, because we were one of the districts that were open. Um, and so, you know, we had, we had to kind of put a stop to that um, and tell folks to wait. But I am happy to report the, the people that were interested, they're still wanting to come and put in an application for next year. So we did anticipate some slots will already be filled. However, per grade level, this is what we're looking at, approximately about 30 slots that are available total, um, which would bring our numbers up to 224. We do not have pre-K represented in this grid because um, preschool is a kind of a, a different element. Um, and as you'll see, we also really can't anticipate right now what our kindergarten numbers will look like. Um, in last year, we had a really, we were really excited to have a kindergarten um, registration informational night highlighted. And I believe the date for that was the first week of March and we ended up having to cancel. And so um, it was such a shame because we were going to hopefully draw in some more kindergarten families and have people explore our school. Um, we're gonna continue to do that. Um, we really value our, our uh, school choice population. And so, um, so we're hoping to grow that. So those are the slots that we currently have for each grade level. Anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. I just want to clarify one thing, Jen. I know you and I know this backwards and forwards, but obviously that total estimate are your students in, um, you don't have a number for kindergarten. No, so no that's, not. that's not your total ATS Correct. enrollment projection for next year. So we don't know what kindergarten at this point would be. Not for, yeah, for kindergarten and for preschool. No questions from me. I think it's great that um, you have the opportunity in every grade, uh, it seems at this point, uh, for folks to have a school choice slot. We like to make it available at each grade level, Heather, just so that if there's a family with multiple siblings, yeah. with multiple children, um, there's an opportunity for a whole family to come, which is important to us. That's great. And Ms. Camuso has opened the doors wide. So get the word out. Hawkins Academy is open for business and please drive some students our way. Yeah, we tried to add up uh, to, you know, allow for 55 kids per grade. So depending, uh, some of you may or may not recall that at one point about a decade ago, our numbers were in this area and, and reaching this area. And since then we've seen them go down. Um, we know that's again, not specific to Hadley, but that's a, a larger concern nationally. So I would love to see those numbers go up again. Um, we have the staffing and the resources to do so. We have some really competitive programs and some great things to offer as Humera mentioned. So we have put those slots in to open that up to other families that might wanna join us. And while we're not looking at this right now, I wanna remind us that our school choice numbers have actually increased steadily. And the number of people who have been leaving our district has been increasing, has, has been decreasing steadily. So we're actually um, 
we're going in the in the right direction, the direction in which we've been working towards many for these last few years. Um, I do have a question about 330 students. Of course, uh, we're all expecting that we'll be in a matter of months vaccinated, back in person, everything back, will be back to normal in a, in a matter of time. But if we do hit our, our, our goal uh, of 330 students, 55 in each grade, would we have the infrastructure, the, the, the um, size of our facility and, um, and so forth to be six feet apart? Uh, probably not the way we are right now. So you'd probably have to do more, you know, it's more similar to other schools where they're only having half the class come in or certain days. So that is a consideration. You're right, these numbers are based on assuming that students can be in classes as students are normally in classes. Three feet apart is pretty much our usual when we measured that at the beginning of the year uh, for our district, we're lucky and we don't have 40 kids in a, a classroom usually unless they're in band or chorus. So that isn't so much of a concern, but the six feet apart, I think that would probably present a problem. We may have to, if we were not 100% back to normal, we may have to continue with the hybrid model. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. We also had some more flexibility in the fall with outdoor options too, of bigger, larger covered spaces. Yes. Um, I have a question. Um, in past years, what percentage of slots have we filled? So I know what we have open and available and what our max is, but of those, what have we, on, in general, what have we been filling for those? I can't give you an exact percentage. I can tell you that Hopkins Academy always has seats uh, open. We don't fill all of those seats. Um, and had the elementary, just about the majority of them, if not all of them get gobbled up. There is more competition that gets introduced when you get into secondary in terms of charter school options. Um, yeah, that practice is too. Is this is vocational education? Is this a lot? Because I just don't remember. Um, is this a lot more slots available this coming school year than we've had in past years? Or is this? It's about thirty-five more. Because, well, I shouldn't say slots available. Typically, April, I think we've we've said fifty per class, right? So we've added five to each class. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so. The, the incoming seventh grade class too is particularly small for an incoming graduating class. So we did have recently graduating class of that size, but that is smaller than the average class size. So you also see a larger number in that particular grade. Mm -hmm. In light of the fact that we're one of the only schools that has been open since uh, September, mm -hmm. and that we've been doing in-person education um, fairly consistently. We could very well have a good majority of these 83 slots um, filled. And it sounds to me, I mean, you wouldn't be proposing this number if you weren't confident that we could handle it. Um, I just want to, I just want to say that that would be a pretty sizable increase in enrollment, a pretty big jump in um, in the organization in a matter of months. Yeah, I think that um, certainly as April points out, I mean, if you, I can't share the screen because it's on the network drive, but I do have the total student enrollment and in October 1st of 2009, October 1st of 2010, October 1st of 2011, the districts have more than 700 children in it. And now you're just at about 500, which has some, all kinds of consequences that not the majority of which aren't terrific. Um, so yes, I believe that certainly the district, that capacity hasn't changed. We have the capacity to meet the need. If the need arises, we hope it does. You've probably also noticed though that there are school committees that are going on the record taking votes saying right now we're open in September because they're very afraid of losing even more children. They're they're leaving students to school choice. So districts are making moves to signal to families that um, they're intending on returning business as usual in the fall. 
So hopefully we see, we, we always, we really appreciate our school choice families and what they bring to the district. So hopefully we have more, but um, yeah, I'll be optimistic. Maybe we do fill all of those seats. We have not historically. I'm excited about the prospect of filling these seats given all of the work that's gone into, you know, years ago we were talking about marketing, right? Marketing our, our schools, marketing our programs, the, the grants that have been received, the programs that have been approved. I just want to share that with, you know, the students that are interested in coming in and being part of that. So um, I, I think it's great. I would love it if we could hit these numbers. I, I think it's great too. I just I guess I'm, my only question, maybe this is more because I'm the new guy, but you, you mentioned, Danny, that 50 was kind of the number you guys have put out in the past. Is there a sense that there could be more traction this year, given the fact that we've been open? Is that why we're kind of bumping to 55 or are we just kind of trying to shoot the moon on this one? Ms. Commissioner, I'm going to let you answer that. <laughs> okay, I think that. I think that's just me being ambitious. So yeah. I think it's, you know, Again, Annie cited those years with the higher numbers and, and my first graduating class at Hopkins was in 2009. So I, I remember being there and teaching during that time. And you know, there's a lot of other benefits too that come with having a larger student body in terms of our, our general programming. So you know, forgetting all of the new great programming we have, even like our band program, if you have 83 more students in the school, you can just do so much more. So I think, you know, I, I'm just being ambitious. I'm just like, why not try to, to, get, to get them in there? We have this space. We have a lot of classes. As I said earlier this year, when we had to try to make the constraints that Desi had that other schools couldn't make at three feet, uh, we only had 10% of our classes that couldn't make six, six feet, I think. So we can fit the students. That's not a problem. Um, and I think, you know, teachers, teachers want to teach them and we want to bring in more kids. So why not? Maybe I'm crazy. We might just, <laughs> we might just in four months say that to me instead, but <laughs> that's where I am today. This does require action. The school committee does have to vote to, uh, if they so choose to approve the school choice slots as presented. So we, we already have people that have submitted applications, but now we can start accepting them. Motion to approve uh, these school committee, uh, sorry, school choice slots for the next academic year. Second. Great, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Or abstain. All right. Keep being ambitious, April. I love it. It's great. Yes. Agreed. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to move on to how we um, predicted the CDC guidance, right? Our public school <laughs> implementation of yeah. updated CDC guidance and the nice chart that you made. Yeah, so hopefully I can move this over and do this. Yeah, I will just, uh, everything I've said, but again, so the CDC recommended universal mask wearing. Again, we have this in place regardless of age. Of course, there are disability uh, exceptions that are allowed for students or adults. Uh, physical distancing. This part is important because I know it's been a challenge for people who just wish that we could have just had everything exactly as it was to start with. Uh, the reason that it's been such a painstaking process at the high school is because cohorting is still the gold standard, right? There's nothing to indicate that it isn't. So we're trying to be very careful, and you can see this. The staff at Hopkins under Ms. Camuso's leadership has done a phenomenal job of this. So really balancing the desire for in-person instruction at the high school we've had and the middle school, we've had in-person support available since September 16th. In-person instruction at that level does require students to mix cohorts. Um, it's how they've been scheduled, it's how their classes work. The only way you get around that is to track students, which we have no interest in doing. So um, we did cohort, we created very, um, I don't know, complicated but doable plans. And I really credit uh, April Camuso, Jason Burns, um, Brianna Lynch, uh, so many people, and people who are working on this now, but in August, um, this was, this was two brains on fire of uh, Jason Burns and April Camuso with a lot of other help to figure out how can we 
cohort students and still try to give them access to um, their teachers. Limiting visitors, installing barriers uh, when it's not possible to maintain six feet of distance. We've certainly gone, I think, above and beyond in, beyond in trying to teach hand washing and respiratory etiquette. We had a cleaning and maintenance checklist that was part of our fall reopening plan and contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. As I've said, we've provided families with a checklist. We have a color-coded guide to help families understand the difference between isolation, quarantine, and what it means to be a close contact. And we have a document, um, as I said before, if folks get an email that just says, oh, there's, we've had another case, unfortunately, or if you've been on the receiving end of a phone call for contact tracing, we are extremely thorough and everything is documented from the positive case when they were became symptomatic or when they went for the test that came back positive that they are asymptomatic, their window, their close contacts, who contacted, with whom did we speak, what information did we provide them. We have a template that we keep on that and we maintain all of those documents for the district. And so the only two, um, um, oh, and community transmission. This is a part that's new to the CDC guidance. And um, we contacted Harvard School of Public Health back in August and got their input. And then you folks deliberated on that. For, uh, we're very thoughtful about it, very thorough. And I will point out that they're recommending tracking daily incidence rate per 100,000 for the previous seven days. When I show you the data for last week, you can see where I do that every week by hand for folks because that data, those data are available from uh, DPH. The positivity rate for the last seven days is not currently readily available from DPH. I did email them and say, given the new CDC guidance, can you, can you make it as available as you've made the average daily incidence rate? I'm happy to do it by hand. Um, and they said they're working on that. We do it uh, over the last 14 days. Um, and uh, we have had a phased in model. And uh, the only pieces that we didn't have were uh, testing and vaccines and those kinds of things are underway. So again, um, it was some really good work and I'm not implying that it was perfect or that everybody on any given day was happy, frankly, with anything that we, in this case, I'll say I was doing, but it really was very, very solid work. And I don't know what I'll do with myself next year when I'm not contact tracing, so that's that. I'm sure you'll find a grant to apply for any. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And, and it was really helpful seeing the mapping. Um, and it was just, you know, everybody's put in so much hard work over the last year, as you said, in a couple of weeks, it'll be a year. And I just, I applaud everyone for um, sticking with it, having an open mind, continually documenting. I mean, Lord knows how many times we went back to those plans, just updated them, refined them, um, and being willing to have just the, the conversations around um, all of the different resources that we've all had conversations uh, regarding. So um, thank you for pulling that together. It was just, it was very reassuring to me to see that. Um, and I felt, I felt like I, it was like, okay, I feel like we're in a really good place. I'm knocking on wood as I say it. We're entering into this discussion around pooled testing. You know, I just, I'm encouraged by the place that we're in. I can show the data on the weekly dashboard if that's helpful. So, um, all right, I'm starting with this page here, which is uh, the CDC. Threshold. So I have, there are multiple tabs in this, and I just want you folks to know what I'm referring to um, when I talk about uh, doing something by hand. Um, come on, there we go. So the changes, so you can find on the DPH website, um, you can find every day the number of new cases. So that's just simply a matter of adding up the last seven days um, and uh, subtracting your totals and finding the change in perc the percentage change from one week to the next. They don't have that, you can't do that right now with testing positivity. That's what hopefully they'll 
enhance their website so that that's easier to do. Um, I want folks to understand we didn't have district data. This didn't get update, updated over the school break because the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education did not um, did not add any uh, information since we had school break. And um, we did see an increase in average daily incidence rate for Hampshire County. Um, it did back, back up, testing positivity stayed the same. Things are looking better in Hadley. Um, I mean, there's more cases. Oh, I'm sorry, it went up slightly in Hadley as well. Things were coming down, it went up slightly in Hadley last week as well. In terms of total district cases, um, this includes the information that I most recently gave families. Um, so we had uh, one additional case of a student um, that we were notified of over break. Um, and so we're up to a total of 16 cases in the district and you can see those at um, both schools. And those are the data for this week. All right, thank you. And then there was some transportation guidance that was updated as well. Yes, uh, just so you know, that's available. It was in the weekly newsletter as a link. And of course, all these documents are in a public folder. All those links that, um, that folks get in the weekly newsletter before a school committee meeting, those remain in public folders. You can go back and review them. So the new transportation guidance says that you can have two students on a bench. We, st we currently still have one student on a bench, but that you can have two students on a bench. The only time we have two students on a bus bench is if they're from the same family, if they go to the same kind of after school care and the parents have given permission. The reason that the department has changed uh, its guidance, and this was with input, a lot of input from Joseph Allen, one of the individuals we spoke to last summer from Harvard about our thresholds and indicators for uh, different learning models is because of the number of the rate of air exchange that you get when even a bus window is open just cracked a few inches. I mean, you can get almost 40 air exchanges per hour. Um, and so having the previous guidance was making it extremely challenging for many districts to offer in-person instruction. And they've amended the guidance, as I said, to allow for two students on a bench. We don't need that at this point, but it is something that we may be doing in the future. And uh, we'll certainly keep families surprised of any changes. Thanks, Annie. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, the next topic, um, this is a discussion item for us, uh, the impact of UMass infection rates on Hadley Public Schools. Um, we did have some uh, parents reach out to us and um, one of whom th that I'm aware of chose to write a letter to the Gazette uh, in terms of a um, really just a, 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 hey, UMass students, understand that your actions not only impact your community, but it impacts the community around you, namely, you know, our town, our district, our county. Um, and yeah, those recent UMass inflation in, in number of cases, um, you know, we, we see that in terms of the impact in our local community. Um, I think a question for this group is, in, in lieu of us putting together any kind of committee-based letter um, to either the Gazette or to UMass, I'm wondering whether it should be a topic that is, Annie, part of, frankly, part of the interview with the Gazette, just about, we have a small district and our district is influenced by large population swings like what happened at UMass in, in terms of, and don't even restrict it to our district. We have a, a small community that is surrounding a town that has a population influx when you have a number of students coming in and coming out um, at, at, you know, in any given semester. So it might be worth just talking about that impact in terms of how that can affect um, our community. We've seen it a little bit on the news already in terms of some of the local stories uh, regarding UMass students who have uh, jobs in the community or UMass students who um, want to uh, you know, essentially go to our local businesses and just some of the um, issues that were encountered around that. So 
this was more of a, an opportunity for us to be able to just recognize that um, families are concerned about this. Our, you know, the parents that send their kids to our school are concerned about this and making sure that it's understood by the UMass community that it's not just isolated to their campus or to the town of Amherst. I just wanted to clarify, Heather, because I think um, based on what was sent out, she she sent the letter to UMass, their UMass newsletter or whatnot. She didn't put it in the Gazette. It was in the- Thank I you, Sarah. I, I will clarify that. I'll just take a look to go back to that email. I think it would be, um, it would be a nice op-ed piece for the Gazette potentially. Um, this is such a tricky thing, right? Where uh, Hadley is an, sort of an economic center for the region. We are so dependent on area commerce. Um, I'm not very in touch with all that is happening on restrictions, but I know that we, um, that there was um, some consequences as a result of um, limitation of places that UMass students could, um, could, you know, go patronage. Um, but I, and I think that that was reversed, but I, I feel like we have to just strike the right tone and really appeal to people's reason. Um, young people are very smart and um, this generation is very societally conscientious and aware. And if we can appeal to young people's sense of um, social responsibility um, and impact the ripple effect of their, um, their choices on young people and their schooling and, the, um, and so on and so forth, that that would be the right um, tone to strike. So I, I think that it's um, an artful message. I think a, an op-ed piece from a parent in a local newspaper makes sense from a school committee perspective. I think um, we just need to be mindful and sensitive about how we lead that conversation. And thank you for that, Humara. And Tara, I did go back and look and it was sent to the UMass newspaper, which if, if if that is the Daily Collegian, I don't know if that's that's what it is or not. Um, that is carried in the Gazette, I think, once a week as well. Oh, good to know. Um, I'm personally, um, I I'm I'm appreciative for the parent who decided to take that outreach. I think that um, you know, from what I read of it, um, it was it was a really good piece for her to write um, in her opinion on, on what's impacting and letting, letting students know on a more um, individual level how it's impacting. Um, I'm hesitant to um, go out and state something publicly in the Gazette um, in regards to UMass in particular. Um, I guess it feels, I, I, I feel singling them out and I understand they're a large body. Um, but I think it's more important to point out just community impact um, um, on what happens at our schools and how what goes on in our surrounding community. And it may not be just UMass. We've got a lot of surrounding towns who come to Hadley to utilize resources, whether it be restaurants or um, businesses of any sort. And so just community impact in general, rather than singling out UMass would be, okay to mention in some form. I don't know how you would do that, um, but that's just my thought. I don't know if you guys can hear me or if I'm frozen. No, we can hear you. So maybe, I mean, and, and I, I definitely respect the, the point of not wanting to isolate any particular community. I mean, UMass is also, you know, has partnered with us on many things. So. I guess the question is um, bringing just the perspective of 
the community impact, perhaps to this Gazette article, was a thought in terms of, again, it's a consideration for a district and a town of our size. I think perhaps when we talk about the uh, indicators and the thresholds that the school committee established and why they established them, I think it's about those indicators and thresholds are about community transmission rates to Terrace Point. So it, um, there's a way to say that, of course, this is what was established. This is why it was established or how we came to that uh, decision. And um, what it means is when community transmission rates increase and we know why they increase, right? When people gather, when they don't wear masks, when they don't socially distance, then these rates increase and it does have an effect on the accessibility of in-person instruction, which can have you know, really dire consequences for children and for their families. But I will say selfishly, I'm gonna make sure that the focus stays on what a wonderful place Hadley is. I have a laser-like focus on what I'd like this article to do. <laughs> so just to point out uh, what a great school system this is. And while we as a school district may not take aim directly at a large institution like UMass in our backyard that has a, the ability to dramatically affect rates, is there the possibility of seeding that well-written op-ed piece in the Gazette so that a parent perspective could be shared? Uh, because that is not an institutional perspective or a town perspective necessarily, but a, you know, an individual perspective. And you can't take that away from a human who has two young children and who you know, sees it very clearly. Um, we, we could have both of those things happen at the same time. Okay. Anything else on this? All right. Okay, well, yeah, and I think if there are any parents who are interested in submitting something, I do appreciate the um, the parents who reached out to us. They basically didn't want us to be caught off guard if we saw a letter from a Hadley parent talking about this impact. Um, and I do appreciate them sharing this with us in terms of um, us being able to see it and support them uh, in, through this discussion. Okay, the last topic then we have is just school committee uh, discussion around pooled testing. So we had a presentation earlier on pooled testing. Um, it is an action item that we need to take in terms of approving the pooled testing program. We uh, received some good questions during the Q&A and had a nice demo of the Q-tip swab process for us. So. Any questions, concerns, kind of lingering things that we need to address uh, before we move forward with this? Well, I, I have a question. Um, just for parents to understand, and I don't know how it works logistically um, when we start out with um, funding under the, under the state. If a parent, say, starts out and is uncomfortable with the thought of it, and then they start talking to more parents or their students come home and explain the process and they suddenly become interested in it, can they sign up and consent for their child to get testing if it's not right at the beginning? Yeah. Now, what exactly that looks like in terms of pool stability and um, what that means, we would work out with our testing partner, but the reason I immediately said yes is because obviously the statistics that Robin had uh, researched regarding Watertown, clearly that more people were added on. And of course, it is entirely a family's decision. It's a staff's individual decision. Nobody will be compelled to do this. But we do know that the more people who test, the better, because we're more likely to pick up asymptomatic cases. We pick up an asymptomatic case and we prevent possible spread from happening in the schools. But you, it's not a one and done. People can opt in or out um, should they choose to. Week to week, we don't want you to do that. that that's not gonna work for pools, but we understand that it may take some, some folks some time to think about it. But ideally, it's just as easy as fluoride testing. 
you opt in, you opt out, right? And it's, it's a known, we have a procedure, it's pretty straightforward. Ideally, it's that straightforward. I have to say, you know, I, um, I, I raced directly from dinner right onto the call. We went right into pool testing. And so the meeting was blaring out loud with the entire family listening. And my kid, my 12 year old was looking over the shoulder as Robin was swabbing her nose. And, um, and he was like, oh, that's easy. <laughs> and so if a 12 year old is like, I can do that, that's not a big deal. I think that this is such a no-brainer and it's opt-in. So there's no downside. I feel like we just have to try this and see if it provides a little bit more assurance about community spread and gives us a little bit more assurance to get people back into schools and feeling confident about um, the level of risk that the family faces. So I agree with you, Himera. And, um to share the, the similar, because I think a lot of parents at this point in time probably have some sort of experience now with getting a COVID test, right? If not themselves and their kids or whatnot. And um, my son was ill back in November with just a very mild cold and we did need to send him for testing. And I had spent the whole 10 minute drive there prepping him that this is gonna be really, really uncomfortable. This was you know, way back when, and they were still doing the deep nasal. Um, and I said, it's going to be really uncomfortable, but it's really, really quick. And I gave him the lowdown of exactly how it was going to happen because he's he's better off when he's prepared. And when we had got there, they said, no, we switched over. We don't do the deep nasal anymore. And I said, great. And he finished it. And again, five seconds later, he was done. And he was like, oh, that was easy. And, and he's eight, you know, so I, I think it is really, really easy to do. And I think it's a really, really um, great measure to have in place um, available to staff and to students to have that extra um, feeling of security and information for us as a district to know that what we're doing is working well um, and that we can safely stay open right now and keep working this way. So I'm really excited to get this started and thank you Robin and thank you Allison for this because I'm just I'm really excited so I hope as many people um, as possible do participate and have their kids participate in it because it's only going to help the more that we have. Yeah I agree. Me too. Same here I think it's a great great opportunity. I just want to add one quick note, not to say that we shouldn't do it, but just to be transparent that at Hopkins, because students are opting off a week, they're going to be testing some students every week and some students every other week potentially. So we have talked about that. Um, and whether or not we look into, again, part of this will depend who consents, right? There's always a possibility that certain students might show up to the school on their off week to still get tested. But I do want everyone to know, because we said they would be tested every week, that that won't necessarily be the case. It's still more information than no information. So it's still valuable, but I just do want people to know that ahead of time um, so that you guys know how it would look at Hopkins. Great, thank you for it, April. All right, so this is an action item. Is there a motion to approve the pooled testing program as presented? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any, do I abstain? Uh, no, you don't have to abstain for this. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to. And I approve. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so Chris, I hope you finished your dinner uh, by now. 740, so you probably did. Time for Chris's business manager reports. I've had plenty of time, so I am all done, thank you. Uh, so I have three reports for you tonight. The first is the expense report from the uh, local budget. Again, uh, we're in good shape with this, still about $3.2 million or so remaining to be spent. And uh, you know, just in looking at the report, one thing I noticed is that there are several line items where I think we are over encumbered on. Um, you know, what we do a lot of times is we take the prior year's bills and we build the budget not only around those, but also um, around when we encumber this year, we take certain things into account to say, okay, we're going to use more of this than we thought or less of that than we thought. Uh, and we encumber accordingly. And just in looking at some of the expenses year to date, I'm looking at things, uh, you know, like water, um, even electricity where we're below what we thought we would be at. 
And um, so I'm going to have to just adjust those and bring us more in line with where I think we'll end up with at the end of the year, which it's a good thing because it's, it's always nice to be over encumbered than under because, uh, you know, rather than, uh oh, where are we going to come up with the funds for this? It's like, okay, we have, we have plenty of funds for this and that's a good thing. Um, Chris, there was one item on page three, and maybe this is an example of that, the contracted services elementary school that was um, over encumbered. I was just curious what that was. That was a futures healthcare, um, in, uh, I guess, yes, yeah, so it was an invoice that we had gotten. So that one is actually not one of the um, over encumbered items. It's actually, it was an invoice that we had contracted out some of the uh, special ed services. And so what we're gonna do is just transfer money into that line to uh, bring it back up to where we thought we'd be. When we built the budget, we hadn't planned on using a contracted services for it, but then we decided that it was uh, you know, better for us to do it that way. So that's why that particular one is higher. Got it, thanks. Any other questions on the general fund expenses? Okay, um, I, I'm not sure if it's, I think it's revolving accounts that's next. So we can just jump to that one, please. Got grants um, and then revolving accounts. Oh, grants are next. Okay, I can jump over to grants. Uh, so again, spending down the grants, you can see the COVID ones are largely spent. We, we actually had the 102 grant fully spent, but some of it was um, encumbered money that the bills came in lower than we anticipated. So we have a couple thousand left to spend there. Um, the ESER money, the 113 grant, we still have a, a pretty decent amount. That grant can be rolled into the next fiscal year as well. So there's not a real rush uh, you know, to spend that one down. Some of the other items, the, the 240 special ed is, is being spent at a pretty good pace, which is good. Um, circuit breaker, we're actually in good shape with that as well in terms of what we budgeted to spend and what we have so far. So we may not need to spend all of that that we had budgeted this year, which is definitely a good thing. It's it's always helpful to carry over some extra circuit breaker money if you can. Um, and the rest of the grants, uh, if you look at things like the the 262, the 305, and the 309 uh, grants, those are all just show you. Uh, shutting. It, it, it's basically um, payroll that's coming out of those. So Title One gets paid every two weeks from it. The other two, I just transfer paychecks um, to the grants as we move along the year. So those will be, you know, as, as usual, everything that has to be will be fully spent in this fiscal year. I did the drawdowns today for the grant um, because you can basically do those between the, uh, well, in the typical month, the 20th and the 30th of the month, I guess we only have until the 28th this month. But um, so we're all up to date as far as drawing down the funds goes and uh, we're in good shape with grants as well. So again, I don't know if there's any questions with this report. Nope. All right, then I guess we can move on to the revolving accounts report. Um, most of these had not a lot of changes. If you look at say the athletic and the Hadley kids account, nothing really going on there. Even the student activity account really is, it's pretty much keeping a pretty flat balance. Um, school choice, as you can see, uh, we, we transferred some expenses to it, $450,000 actually we transferred the school choice in December. Now that balance is moving back up again as we got the January payment in. Um, the lunch account, it's nice to see that we have you know, a, a healthy balance in that. It has come down from the beginning of the school year. I think it will go up again. Uh, it, as you can see, it kind of went from the high of 69,000, it went as low as 28, we're back up to 35 and a half now. And as with um, a lot of lunch programs, Hadley's no different. It's a lot of it is front loaded. So we buy supplies and stuff over the summer and we get those bills in you know, September, October and pay them. So now that we have those supplies, there won't be any real reason to buy too many more. Uh, we had some COVID expenses as well that, that were uh, hitting the lunch account. So uh, that's, that's in good shape as well. The preschool, this is one that I discussed either last meeting or the meeting before uh, in terms of we're going to be showing a negative balance. And as you can see, it's uh, at minus 27,000 now. <clears throat> I do expect that one to go as far as about 100,000 by the end of the school year. So 
Um, that's something where we're just going to have to transfer expenses to the school choice account to bring that account back up to zero. And uh, we'll, we'll take care of that at the end of the year when we know the exact amount to move. Any questions on those accounts? Okay, and then the, the fourth item was just that disposition of assets, which kind of got discussed briefly at the beginning of the meeting or maybe even before. We won't be doing that just yet. We, we do have a spare bus at the uh, DPW garage that hasn't run in a couple of years. It needs extensive repairs and I guess both extensive and expensive. Uh, and the bus is old, it was actually scheduled to be replaced, but that didn't go through at town meeting. And what we ended up doing was because it was such an old bus, I didn't really want to spend as much money as needed to be to, uh, re you know, to repair that bus. So I reached out to Five Star and asked how much it would be to lease a bus from them. And uh, it turned out that it was $85 a day. And I said, wow, that's a lot of leased bus days um, before we got up to the amount of the repairs that you know, needed to be done. At the time, they were over $20,000. And, you know, again, seeing as how the bus was old and scheduled to be um, basically traded in, typically with trade in, when you get an old bus like that, we typically get a thousand bucks in trade in. So to spend $20,000 on a bus that we would get a thousand dollars for at the end of the year really just didn't seem to make a lot of sense. So we've still gone on with, you know, if we need a bus, Five Star will lease us one for $85 a day. And that seems to have been working out well. So we did reach out to the DPW just to ask the mechanic to look at the bus and give us a list of exactly what needs to be repaired and what the costs would be at this point in time. And just basically so we can run it by you and, and just ask you, do you want to repair the bus or do you want to just keep going the route we are, are on and, um, and dispose of the asset? So when I get that, um, it'll, I'm, I'm assuming it'll be before the next meeting and uh, then we can just present it to you at that time. Sounds great. Okay. Anything else? I, I don't know if you have any questions or anything. Nope, doesn't look like it. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. All right, any announcements for tonight before we um, get through our action items? I don't know if Dane, Dane Evans Smith is here. I can co-host her. I'm not Dane sure is Dane. here. Let me see here more. Dane, if you want to say anything, you've just been made a co-host. I don't know if you have any announcements. You certainly don't have to. Just want to say thank you all for all your deliberations and all you're doing for the students in this town. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Jane. you, Jane. Appreciate it. Any other announcements for tonight? Yes. Um, I have a quick announcement that um, as part of our um, efforts to make our town more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. We have just announced another three events, a spring series of, um, of topics in March. And, and these events happen on the first Thursday of the month at seven o'clock in Zoom. Um, and you can check them out at hadleylearns.com. The first topic, people wanted to talk about exclusion and inclusion. And specifically microaggressions are a key thing that prevent creating a culture of belonging. Great for any person interested in leadership or HR. And so um, there are resources shared and in particular this amazingly hilarious book, which you may not be able to see. Ah, uh, I don't think I can yeah, share it with you given my background. Anyways, it's called, You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey, Crazy Stories About Racism. It is so funny. It is hilarious. I recommend the audiobook, five hours. Um, and just when you consider like what one person of color experiences over a lifetime, times that by the number of people of color in our community or in our, in our nation, it's just insane. Um, so that's the first topic. The second is housing discrimination, the history of housing discrimination in the US and housing policy in Hadley. And the third is the history of indigenous people in Hadley. And that both of those promise to be very interesting topics. So people come, they're given materials to look at in advance and, and think about. And then we have small breakout sessions in a very safe, unrecorded, 
space and people um, meet and go off and take action that might help make Hadley a more inclusive community. So I highly recommend signing up for any one of these um, and come hang out. Thanks for continuing to provide these forums, Himera. It's really appreciated. You're welcome. I, I just want to add, I, I, I just want to say that we'd love to also to see many new members of the town community come out to those programs. I think they're, they're fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Ethan. Every, every month we see another like three or four new faces and slowly, slowly it's grown and it's, um, it's a pretty great place to meet others and, and feel um, part of something bigger. You can find the registration link in the superintendent update that I sent this weekend. Remember that you often have to click view more on that to view the entire email. And I'll make sure that I keep it in there um, as the, as the uh, program continues. Thank you, Annie. I would like to just take an opportunity to give a shout out to Humera for sharing some resources for me. We ran a, a PD uh, a couple weeks back and I reached out to her and it was such a well-received uh, professional development with the resources that, that um, you use at your group. And so I really want to say thank you so much. And I stole her idea and we're starting a book club um, at Hadley Elementary School with the staff. And I have about 14 staff members who are participating. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, so thank you, Mara. You're That's welcome. Books from Hadley Learns, despite the best intentions. Yep. That's great news. Yeah, I was I was so pleased with how many people signed up and they're really excited about it. And Dr. McKenzie offered to to get the book for them so that they can read it. And um, so that will be happening in March and April. So thank you again. Appreciate Wonderful. It. You're welcome. That's excellent. Um, in a similar uh, topic, we did uh, for uh, our school committee members, we would have received from MASC that they are um, conducting tomorrow evening um, a discussion on bias, inclusion, diversity, and cultural proficiency for school committee members uh, within our division. And <clears throat> actually it's MASC's division 10 is inviting all school committee members. And the speaker um, is Dr. Khalees Warnham, who she spoke in the November uh, online um, MASC meeting, all state meeting that we had that I reported back on as Humera did uh, that discussion. So. Um, if you guys don't have that email or lost it or deleted it, as we sometimes do, because we get quite a bit from MASC, please reach out to me. I'm happy to forward it to you. Uh, but it's great that they're making that opportunity available again uh, for members, uh, including um, superintendents and colleagues. If anybody is interested, just let me know. I'll forward the invitation. Okay, any other announcements for tonight? All right, we had a couple uh, meeting minutes that we needed to approve minutes, uh, updated minutes that we received. We have January 11th and January 25th. Any um, feedback or concerns on the minutes? Is there a motion to approve the January 11th and 25th minutes? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We have no warrants for this meeting. We um, discussed phase three, we discussed school choice slots, we discussed pooled testing, uh, and we are holding on the disposition of property. So I believe that is all of our action items. And we have a whole slew of meetings coming up. Um, so March 8th, we will meet um, our regular meeting and do school committee reports as well as the program, study, program of studies for Hopkins Academy. We'll meet March 15th. Uh, we'll hold that for a special data review, um, health data review meeting. March 22nd is another regular meeting. We'll have the business manager reports uh, with Chris again. And then March 29th, we'll hold that for a special meeting of health data review. And we don't need executive session tonight. That's a, I forgot it was on the bottom there, just so you know. So when you're ready to adjourn, I'm not suggesting you should, but when you're ready to adjourn, you can. Are we ready to adjourn? <laughs> Is there a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank Aye. you. Have a great night.